the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Please be seated. So when I was serving a church in Louisville, we had this Sunday school program. It was called Catechesis of the Good Shepherd. It is a phenomenal program, but each teacher has to go through at least, a, I think, a seven-day training, all-day, every-day training, had flown halfway around the country. Incredible! The rooms are all uh, arranged with, with items that have to be in a particular place. Uh, it's, it's a pure Montessori program, but the... Uh, cost just to get it up and running is astronomical. And uh, my predecessor uh, was passionate about it, got it up and running, and it was running for a couple years. Uh, and I saw the budget line, and it was huge. Uh, and the students at the church only had about five or six uh, children in, 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 in each class at most. And I was wondering, you know, is this really the program that we need to stick with? It's a lot like uh, our godly play, but more elaborate. Uh, and then I had one of the presenters uh, one of our teachers uh, come and, and present to, to me and the ladies of the church, uh, and all of a sudden I was transformed in my opinion of this program. Uh, it was telling how they tell the Good Shepherd story over the course of several years. And I have to be honest, I, I'm a Navy brat. I've always lived near, near water uh, in cities, and the image of a shepherd has never really held much for me. I know all of the, the, the symbolism behind it, but it just doesn't hit me right here. It's not something I'm familiar with. Uh, but this is how they presented it. Uh, and they believed very philosophically uh, that the idea of education uh, from, the, from its roots is to pull out. Uh, and so they don't tell the children necessarily what to believe, but they tell the story in a very peaceful and gentle way. Uh, and they ask questions that invite the children to figure out, what does this mean? What does this mean for me? And so the first year, when they're just being introduced to the idea of a shepherd, uh, they have these figurines, and they've got this green uh, field, uh, probably, truthfully, it was probably less green than rocky uh, in, 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 in real life, um, but they have these sheep, these little sheep, and they have the shepherd bringing in the sheep, and the presenter tells the children that the shepherd is responsible for these sheep, and the shepherd loves these sheep. The shepherd is with the sheep all day, every day, and sleeps with the sheep and knows each one of them by name, knows every hair, every piece of wool on these sheep's head. Knows each one by name. And they know him and they depend on him. Uh, when he calls, they need to know that they need to follow him because there's lots of sheep that belong to different uh, folds that are all gathered together. Uh, and then maybe invite some suggestive questions like, what would it feel like to have someone who takes care of you? What would it feel like to have somebody who knows every hair on your head, who knows you by name, even though there's hundreds of sheep, knows you specifically by name? How would that feel? And then talks a little bit about how they uh, sleep at night, that they, they go into a pen and it's a, a stone in, uh, enclosure that's not really all the way enclosed. It has an opening and talks about all the different sheep that, that, that they get brought into the fold and then we're told that the shepherd sleeps across the opening in between the stones so that if any animal would come in or any person that would come in to hurt or do any damage to the sheep must first cross through him, literally laying down his life for his sheep. What might it feel like to have a shepherd that's willing to sleep between all danger, all peril, all snatchers, and yourself? <coughs> you think the sheep slept knowing there was somebody there to take care of them? And you start to feel, and then it's told so gently, and you start to feel what it might be like to sleep that securely, to know that somebody is that invested in your safety, in your security, in your life. And then it goes on from there, and it talks about uh, the, the shepherd uh, taking the sheep out and calling them by name, and, uh, and then if one of them disappears, that the shepherd will leave all the rest behind at great risk to his job to go and find that one because he knows every hair on that, on that sheep's head. What would it feel like to have somebody that would leave everything else behind and come after you if you were lost? Would that make you feel secure or safe? Would it make you feel loved? And that first year, they might not even introduce the idea that they're supposed to realize that they're the sheep and that they're supposed to realize that the shepherd is God, but, but viscerally, they feel what it might be like 
be cared for like that. And then maybe the next year, uh, they learn a little bit more about this shepherd who is willing to lay down his life for a sheep. And maybe they learn the story of Jesus being willing to die for all of his children, all of uh, the sons and daughters of God that, uh, that he knows by name. And that Jesus loved them so much that he put his life between them and evil and all that the world could do. And even begged for the forgiveness of those sheep that, uh, that didn't know him, that, uh, that, helped, that helped hurt him. What would it be like to have somebody that loved you that much? And they start to realize that they're the sheep. And what does it feel like to have a God that was willing to go to that length to show you that love, to take care of you? And then the next year, as they get a year older and they're starting to understand what it is that we do up here at the table, they're introduced to an empty table. And the shepherd that invites all of the sheep to the table, and there's an image of the shepherd behind the altar and all of the sheep gathered round. It says, that same shepherd that knows each of you by name, that knows every hair on your head, wants so much for you to come and be gathered around this table with him. Slowly, as she peacefully tells the story, the sheep disappear, and in the place are little figurines of children, parents and grandparents, a priest. And in the place of the shepherd, there's bread and there's wine. And we're told that maybe, maybe our shepherd invites us all to this table. Maybe our shepherd has called each one of you by name here today, this Sunday, to church. Maybe the shepherd's still calling you to come and have this special meal prepared by a shepherd who laid down his life, who put his life between all evil, all hurt, all things we can do to one another and ourselves. What would it be like to be invited to that kind of meal? kind of special meal wrapped in all that love. And as they realize it, as they see their images, as they realize that every Sunday they participate in the story of the Good Shepherd, eyes light up. And they realize it's their story. It was pretty hard to cut funding after that. But I realized the power of that story and of that image. And now I can't look at the Good Shepherd apart from seeing that table and that invitation, that shepherd that knows us each by name, that calls us each individually around that table, that prepares so lovingly a meal to remind us that he did lay down his life for us. And so we have the story today, the, good, the story of the good shepherd. And Jesus is there uh, at the portico, at the Solomon's portico, where kings uh, would make decrees. Uh, this was uh, the part of the temple where where. where where kings would be able to come up and, and tell people what, what, what had happened. Uh, and it also is the feast of the dedication, which uh, is Hanukkah. So it's a feast that commemorates the rededication of the, of the temple and of the altar that had been uh, desecrated by the Greeks about 160 uh, years before Jesus was born. And with John, you kind of wonder whether everything's significant, because he had about 100 years to mull it over between when these events happened. Uh, and I think what Jesus is saying is that this is a new dedication. This is a new thing taking place. Just like that festival of the dedication where they celebrated that when they, uh, when they rebuilt the altar, when they dedicated it, uh, they only had one flask of olive oil uh, that really wasn't supposed to last more than one day. Uh, the rest had all been, uh, 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 been desecrated. And so they took the one sealed thing of olive oil, and the story goes that they uh, filled up the menorah, and it burned not just for that one day, uh, but for eight days, which was long, uh, long enough time for them to, to get more oil and to, to, to consecrate it uh, so that they could continue to practice. Uh, but this is something new uh, that, that Jesus is doing. This is a new rededication and the new altar uh, where the lamb, the shepherd who became the lamb, was sacrificed for all of us so that we always have no intermediary, nothing separating us from God ever again. And then he tells them, I am the shepherd. My sheep know me. My sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they come to me. And some people don't hear my voice because they're not of my flock. And I don't think this is an exclusionary message as much as it is Jesus saying, there is nothing between me and God. We are one. The person who came 
and challenged the church, when they left the widow outside the church walls, uh, when they failed to take care of the sick, when they put the law and the Sabbath, uh, 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 keeping the Sabbath ahead of taking care of, of God's uh, brothers and sisters and God's children. The people that don't recognize the truth of who God is in me don't hear my voice. But I am the revelation of God. I came to show you what God's heart looks like. And so those who hear, those who know what it's like to have God's love spilled into their lives, those who know what it's like to be called to a special meal like this where somebody did lay down his life, they will hear my call and they'll gather. So today as we celebrate the fourth week of of Easter, as we continue through the Easter season, We're reminded to realize not just that a life was laid down, that that life wasn't wasn't the end of the story, that that life rose again, but we're called to figure out what it means to live in fidelity to that truth. What's it like to receive that grace that is spilled out and to take it out into the world? And then I think we need to turn to Acts, where we have an Easter story wrapped inside an Easter story. Peter, who we've talked about over the last couple weeks, uh, has been struggling with what he wants to be as a person, with the faithful uh, person that he desires deeply to be, and the human that he is. Peter who says, I'll go, and then denies him three times. The Peter who, when asked, do you love me, do you agape me, says, yes, I love you, but only as much as I'm able. But he's handed the church, and a week later, he's caught fire. He's an Easter person. The thing that got Jesus nailed upon the cross, the raising of Lazarus from the dead. Now he goes in and he raises someone from the dead knowing what this means. He's a marked man. When he says, Tabitha, get up, he knows that means he'll be put down. That like his Lord and Savior, his life will be laid down for the sheep. And Tabitha, her Easter story is that she has new life. So we're the church, the body of Christ. Easter people who have been invited to the table and will be fed. But the question is, how do we walk out of this place? How do we walk out Easter people so that we can be other people's Easter story? So that people can say, what happened? Wow. That's Easter. Amen.